Okay, so today we are going to be talking about testimony. Specifically, we're going to address the question, who can we trust? And when we can gain knowledge from someone else's testimony. So before we talk about testimony specifically, I want to zoom out a little bit and talk about social epistemology in general. And we're going to begin by talking about how that contrasts with traditional epistemology. So traditional epistemology examines questions like what is knowledge? And you'll often talk about the justified true belief theory of knowledge and then the ways that Gettier challenged that and then solutions that people have tried to propose to Gettier's challenge. And you might also talk about questions like how much can we know? And is skepticism true? And if so, is it a global version that says we can know basically nothing or a local version that says, you know, we can only, um, we can't have knowledge in a certain realm. And then various responses to skepticism like Moore's, you know, I have a hand, so there must be an external world. So that's traditional epistemology. And note that traditional epistemology mainly focuses on a single agent, what that person may or may not know, what they should believe, what they can doubt. So when you think about kind of Descartes in his meditations, it's just him sitting there by himself, thinking about what he can know, what he can doubt, that he's a thinking thing. Um, so it's kind of epistemology in isolation. <laughs> Um, what's cool about social epistemology is that it points out that other people affect what we can and cannot know. Um, we're not just people that know things in isolation, but we're, we interact with people, we depend on their knowledge, we give them our knowledge. So there is kind of this give and take that traditional epistemology doesn't really capture. And here's some of the questions in social epistemology. Uh, when should we trust experts? What should we do if experts disagree? Um, how should we respond when smart people disagree with us? Can we continue to hold our own opinion or should we change our opinion in some way? And then the question that we're going to talk about today is when can we trust another person's testimony? So when it comes to testimony, what I want to start with is this warm up case that I think will be sort of helpful when thinking about the theories that we're going to talk about. So here is the case in the first case you see a red ball in front of you with your own two eyes. And in the second case, your friend who is very reliable tells you that there's a red ball in front of you, but your eyes are closed, so you don't actually see it. And the question is, should you be as confident that there's a red ball in case two as you are in case one? Um, another related question, can you know that there is a red ball in front of you in both cases? And some people might say, well, in case two, you have uh, worse evidence because you only have testimonial evidence and we shouldn't rely on testimony or trust it as much as if we see something with our own two eyes. But what's interesting is that you probably rely on testimony a lot more than you might think. Here's a bunch of examples. So you believe a random person on the street for questions about what time it is or directions to a train station, even if you don't know who they are, you don't really have information about their background or the things that they know. Um, your mom calls you and she says you, she went to a park today. You believe her, you don't try to like verify it or uh, double check first, look for more evidence, you just believe what she says. Um, we often believe map makers that the world is basically the way that the globe portrays it even though we haven't traveled to many or even most of those places ourselves. Uh, we believe the theories that scientists advance, even though most of us don't fully understand all the reasons for those theories or the arguments for and against. Um, and just consider how often we Google things, you know, um, especially because smartphones are everywhere now. You just Google a recipe uh, and then you bake your cake for 30 minutes at 400 degrees even though you don't know who wrote the recipe and you don't necessarily look at other recipes to verify that that one's correct. Or you'll just Google, how tall is LeBron James? And you believe the first result without really giving it much thought. So in many of these cases, we just rely on another person on the internet. We don't take time to double check and we don't even know who that person is. So it is interesting how much we rely on testimony to get information. Um, this brings me to sort of three views about when we can gain knowledge from testimony. So what we just talked about is how often we do believe things on the basis of testimony. And then philosophers will debate, well, is this rational and can this give us knowledge? And there's sort of three views and we'll sort of start with the most skeptical. 
And this is what I call testimony skepticism. This was Locke's view. And Locke said you can actually never get knowledge from testimony. So in our initial example with the balls, in the case where your eyes are closed and your friend says there's a red ball there, you could raise your confidence that there's a red ball there, but you could never come to know on the basis of just testimony. You would have to have other evidence as well. The problem with this is that it leads to a pretty widespread, widespread but not fully global skepticism. Um, you couldn't know anything unless you had independent evidence. And in like, if someone told you something, you would always have to have independent evidence in order to gain knowledge of that thing. So you couldn't know when you were born, for example. There's so many things we believe on the basis of testimony, and this would basically say a lot of the things we think we know, we don't know. So the second view that's kind of a middle view is what's called reductionism. And this view says that you can gain knowledge from testimony, but only if you have a good reason to think that the person who's testifying is reliable. And one of the primary ways you'll sort of test their reliability is by looking at their past track record. And if someone has told you something several times and each time they've told you that something you've kind of independently checked and seen, yes, that's true. Then as you get that evidence over time, eventually you can believe things on the basis of their testimony. But it requires this kind of independent fact checking. And the problem is that even though this is less skeptical than testimony skepticism, it still seems like there's a, le a lot less knowledge than we think we might have. So it seems like children can know things from testimony, even if they're not doing independent fact checking, they can just kind of know that they're going to the park today because their parents told them, for, for instance. So it would mean that children have very little knowledge, but I think even adults often will believe people like when someone on the street tells you what time it is and you've never met them before. Um, sometimes it seems like we could come to know something on the basis of that, even though we haven't done this independent fact checking. So that brings us to a third view, which is known as anti-reductionism. This is basically the view that testimony is innocent until proven guilty, basically. So Jennifer Lackey has this view. Um, and the idea is that you can get knowledge from testimony and you don't have to always have a good reason to believe that the person who's testifying is reliable. Now, this doesn't mean that anytime someone tells you something, you can come to know based on what they say. Um, other things can prevent knowledge from testimony like defeaters. A defeater is a reason to think that the person testifying is unreliable. You might either have good evidence that what they actually said is false or good evidence that they wouldn't know that maybe because they're biased or um, there's kind of some other epistemic defect. But I guess the problem here is you might worry this almost makes knowledge too easy or it leads to gullibility. Um, especially if we don't kind of take the time to think about whether we have defeaters or not. And we're just kind of like, yep, they said it. So you might think, um, you know, this is the least skeptical, but maybe it gives us too much knowledge. So that would sort of be a worry for anti-reductionism. But it is important to note that, again, even if anti-reductionism is true, this doesn't mean that we should always trust testimony. So what I want to kind of move to now is a little bit more practical thing to think about that I think when we're when it comes to trusting others and when we should believe something and when we can gain knowledge from what someone else says, there's two main factors to consider. So the first factor is who said it. And what I have on this slide is basically a bunch of different examples that I think are interesting to think about. And I think as we think through these, we can kind of come up with some general principles about when we should or shouldn't trust someone else. So here's some people who might testify, your friend who's normally reliable, your philosophy professor, <laughs> your priest, pastor, or religious leader, an alien. And then the other factor to think about is, well, what did they say? Maybe they told you what time it is. It's three o'clock. Maybe they said you have a mark on your forehead and this is something you can't verify yourself. Maybe you don't have a mirror or a camera anywhere. Um, but it's something they could easily see if you really did have that mark there. Maybe they'll make a political statement, like Trump is a great president. Maybe they'll make a religious statement, like God exists. Um, and maybe they'll make a moral statement, like eating meat is morally wrong. So one thing to think about is if any of these people and others as well testified each of these things to you, could you trust them? Could you gain knowledge um, from what they said? 
And one thing that a lot of philosophers think is that no matter who tells you, there are certain realms like morality where we actually can't gain knowledge through testimony alone. So if your friend says eating meat is morally wrong and you've never thought about it before and you decide to believe that just because they told you, philosophers think there's something weird going on there. That's not really how we should get our moral knowledge. Um, and they, and some philosophers have suggested that in certain realms like morality, maybe we need to come to know or understand something for ourselves. So even if anti-reductionism is true, um, knowledge from testimony might still have its limits and there might be realms where it's really difficult to get knowledge from testimony. All right, so what we have covered today, um, first we've talked about what is social epistemology and how it contrasts with traditional epistemology. Then we've talked about a bunch of examples that show that we probably rely on testimony more than we might think. Then we've discussed three views in the philosophy of testimony, testimony skepticism, reductionism, and anti-reductionism. Then we've talked about sort of two things to consider when it comes to relying on testimony, who said it and what they said. And then finally, we've talked about whether there might be some realms like morality where knowledge requires more than just testimony.